how many of you um, have seen from time to time, maybe, someone communicating with sign language? Have you seen that? It's interesting, isn't it? It's, it's very interesting. Um, my daughter, Erin, <coughs> studied sign language for several years. She was going to be an, a sign language interpreter. And in fact, she was very interested when some, some difficult things had happened where maybe there'd been a disaster or something like that. You see uh, a, a county sheriff or, or some official standing up there and off to the side, you see someone signing. Um, she thought that would be a pretty good position to have. You know, communication is something that sometimes we take uh, for granted. Communication between us and our loved ones is very important. Communication about how God communicates with us is ultimately very, very important. You know, um, I've had difficulty hearing for quite a few years in my life now. I'm, I'm a little past half a century old, and that's pretty young for someone to have to have to wear hearing aids like I wear. Um, but let me tell you, when I got my hearing aids uh, a little more than a year ago, about a year and a half ago, I, I really didn't realize what I was missing in communication. Uh, we would sit at the back table on Friday nights and on, I mean, Wednesday nights and on Sabbath mornings and have Bible study, open our Bibles. And I found it difficult to hear what someone was saying across the table, partly because there was so, there's a lot of commotion in a room full of people. There's a lot of background noise. And it would just be difficult for me to pick out if someone wasn't speaking where I could see their lips, read their lips a little bit. It was difficult for me. So. I had the opportunity to, uh, to get hearing aids. And what prompted me to do that was the fact that it was difficult for me to hear people uh, when, when we were being involved in ministry, you know, reading our Bible, studying. And I knew at that point that uh, even though there's some sort of stigma involved with having hearing aids, so, you know, the, you look at someone who has hearing aids and say, well, that's an older person, or, or that, there's something wrong with that person. And I thought about those things, and I weighed those things, and I just thought, you know, if God wants me to be able to witness and use the tools that he has given me, he's going to make it okay. He's going to make it okay. And so, you know, this presentation this morning is about communication, about listening to God, paying attention to God, taking the words of God and applying them to our lives. And I sat in the audiologist's office and he programmed my hearing aids to enhance the difficult ranges that Another audiologist had already taken a hearing test, so they knew which ranges that I needed help with. So he plugged them into his computer and he adjusted these, these little miracle devices to my ears. The difficult ranges that I had would be enhanced so that I could hear in those ranges better. If I take my hearing aids out or turn them off, it's amazing what I miss. If I'm listening to music, about a third of the ranges just disappear. If I'm outside where I can hear the birds singing, about 95% of that sound goes away. And when I, he, he, he asked me, have you, have you put these on and in your ears yet? I said, no. He said, well, it's going to be amazing for you. As I sat in his office, the door was open. He put these hearing aids in my ears and immediately I could hear someone speaking. 
not just in the next room, but out into the hallway, down the hall to the reception area, the lady was on the telephone. And I couldn't tell exactly what she was saying, but I could tell it was her. And that was amazing to me. I couldn't hear that before. He reached over and he picked up a newspaper and he just crinkled it a little bit. <laughs> and I covered my ears because it was so loud. The sound that, you know, a, a newspaper makes when you crinkle it, when you first put on a hearing device like hearing aids, it, it's, it's almost too loud. You, your brain has to adjust to what these hearing aids are putting into your brain. All these things are just lessons for me about how I have to be in tune with what God is trying to teach me. His communication to me needs to be the most important thing in my life. Well, one of those communications is through my hearing aids. You know, what other people study, what other people share with me about their experience with God and with others in their lives, that really helps me to understand the character of God and what God is trying to teach me too. So I'm eternally thankful for technology that God has placed in human hands to help me hear better as I get older. And I want to just say that even though I've worked in construction-related fields most of my life and been around loud noises, it's not all my fault because on my father's side, there's genetic hearing loss. And on my mother's side is genetic hearing loss. Remember, all our parents can give us are only what they've inherited, what they have themselves. So my mom couldn't give me perfect hearing and my dad couldn't give me perfect hearing. The only thing I could inherit from them is the imperfect ears that I have. So, but I'm, a, I'm grateful for what I have. You know, God wants us, wants us to pay attention to what he's teaching us. So many times today we see a disaster happen and people are screaming, where was God? What, wh why hasn't he been speaking to us? Why hasn't he given us direction so we can avoid these things? And friends, God has been speaking to us. His word is loud and clear. He can speak to you every day through these words. He can bring these words back to your mind. But you know what? You have to put them there for him to speak them to you. That's really what this presentation is all about. What does the Bible say about God's word, God speaking to us? My first text is from Hebrews chapter 4, and here's what it says. <clears throat> the word of God is quick and powerful. Quick, quick, that word here in Hebrews has almost a, a connotation of giving life, quickening is what that word, the root word is, is powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. Think about a two-edged sword. It cuts both directions. That's interesting because it can cut away the sin from our lives and cut away us from that sin. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner and the thoughts and intents of the heart. This text almost gives the word of God personification. And what we know of the word of God is that that is Jesus Christ. Does Jesus know our thoughts and the intents of our heart? Absolutely he does. Absolutely he does. Let's find out what Jesus said about his words. In John chapter 12, I'm going to be going all over the scripture today. And most of my scriptures are going to be up on the PowerPoint. 
Here's what Jesus said in John chapter 12. I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words, he says, and believe not, I judge him not, for I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. And he continues, he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words. What is Jesus trying to say? We reject him by not receiving what he says. Repent, Jesus has told us, and receive his words. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judges him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Isn't that interesting? Jesus is the word of God and all judgment has given into the hands of the son because the son is the son of man also. That judgment has been given into his hands by our heavenly father. And Jesus says in verse 49, he's not spoken of himself. I speak not of myself, he says, but the father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, which I should say and what I should speak. And I know that this commandment is life everlasting. Whosoever I speak, therefore, whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the father said unto me, so I speak. The words of Christ Jesus. Could there be any more important words ever spoken to humanity than the words of Christ Jesus that came straight from his father? The next text is what Corey read to us <clears throat> from John chapter 15. You know, what's, what's interesting, let me give you a little background about this text. If you read in John chapter 15, um, Jesus had just had the last supper with his disciples there in the upper room. The previous text at the end of John chapter 14, let me just uh, look that up in my Bible. I would like to quote that to you. John chapter 14, the final verse is verse 31. It says, but that the world may know that I love the Father as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. And then Jesus says, arise and let us go out or let us go hence. They're getting up from the Last Supper where Jesus took that towel and girded himself and washed the feet of his disciples. And he's heading to the Garden of Gethsemane outside the city. Think about what time of year it is. It's in the spring. It's Passover. Now, if you know anything about Passover, you know that Passover was on the 14th day of the month. Isn't that right, Mark? The 14th day of the month. And the beginning of the month was the new moon, was the, the new moon, there was no moon. Passover is in the middle of the month, it's the full moon. So here are Christ and his disciples going out through the city by night, out the gate, in the full moon, they can see where they're going, and Jesus teaches them about the vine. Maybe, just perhaps, by the full moon, Jesus pointed out a vine that was growing there near the Garden of Gethsemane. And that's where he got this illustration from. He says, I am the true vine. You see, every Jew realized that the Jewish nation was depicted as the vine. The Jewish nation, the Hebrew religion, was depicted as a vine. If you clung to the vine, to the Jewish nation, to the Jewish form of religion, then you were in a safe position. That's what they taught. In fact, on the front of the temple was depicted this vine. And this is what Jesus says. He says, I am the true vine. That vine depicted on the temple was supposed to be a representation of Christ, but the Jews had lost sight of that and could not understand that. Jesus is telling his disciples, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. 
and every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it that it may bring forth more fruit. What does that mean? That even if we're in Christ Jesus, we're going to be trimmed. We're going to be cut back here and there. The things that won't bear any fruit in our lives. That's what Christ is saying. That the Father is going to do a little trimming on you and I through Christ Jesus. That will bring forth more fruit. You know, it's been noted over the last few months and weeks and even several years that we are being tested and tried here at Prophecies of Hope. There's a lot of things that we've gone through. Mark, in your surgery in the last, what, are, what has it been almost six months now? You know, and things continue to happen. Pamela, with, with the, the death in your family just recently, all these things try our faith. The health issues that some of us have been through, Hugh and Betty. And, you know, there's people around us all the time. Corey, you, you talked about how you, you want to pray for your neighbor. You know, we look at these things and we see how God is trying us and our faith. But here's what Jesus said to his disciples in verse 3. He says, now you are clean. What did he mean by that? I put a little asterisk there on the screen there so I wouldn't forget that I'm going to go someplace else and explain what Jesus is meaning here. So the next text is, is John. It goes back to John chapter 13 to explain this. Now you are clean, Christ says. John chapter 13. <clears throat> He's explaining to the disciples as he washes their feet. Jesus saith unto him, he that is washed needeth not, to, not save to wash his feet, but is clean every, every whit. And you are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him. Therefore, said he, you are not all clean. He's calling the disciples clean. And let's go back to the previous text to show why. Now you are clean, verse 3, he says, through the word which I have spoken to you. Christ's instruction, not only in the disciples' lives, but in our lives, has a cleansing effect if we take it in. The word of God through Jesus Christ can have the same cleansing effect in your life that Christ said of his disciples back then. Let's continue with John chapter 15. He said, abide in me and I in you. This is all in relation to the true vine. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no poor can ye except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. If we ask according to Christ's word, the will of the, stay in the will of the Father, then we can ask, having faith that it will be done. And then Jesus says, in this, herein, is my Father glorified. We give glory to God when we abide in Christ's words, when they abide in us, that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples, he says. This is interesting. Christ is making a correlation between abiding in him and having his words have an effect on our lives. His words is what he's talking about. His character, the things that he means deeply, is what he wants to help change, be in our hearts to change our hearts and our minds. 
Look at what he says about these words. In Luke chapter 21, he says, Heaven and earth shall pass away. We read about that this morning in Revelation. Everything that we know is going to pass away, but his words are eternal. They shall not pass away. Why do you think that is? Is it, be, is it because the principles that Jesus speaks about are at the very core and the heart of his Father, the eternal God? I think they are. <clears throat> Mark chapter 8. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The principles that Jesus Christ talked, spoke, preached, are the principles that need to be in our lives. John chapter 8. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. How do we know the truth? By the words of Jesus. In other words, to get to know Jesus, we have to read these words. We really do. So what am I saying on a practical level? Let's pick up the word of God. If we did it every day, if we did it every day, we'd have more and more of Jesus inside of us. Here's John 8 continuing. They answered him, We are Abraham's seed, and we're never in bondage to any man. See, the previous thing is that uh, the, Jesus said to the Jews, The truth will make you free he said, and he's speaking to the Jews, okay? And they answered him and said, we are Abraham's seed and are never in bondage to any man. How, how sayest that we shall be made free? You know, I was marvelous that, at this text. You know, they, they spent 400 years in bondage in Egypt. How can they say that they've never been in bondage to any man? It just doesn't make sense. But there's something else at work here. And it's very subtle. Who are they putting their faith in? Think about it. Huh, we're Abraham's seed, man. We've got the truth. We've got it. How could we possibly be wrong? Isn't that what every single Christian church teaches today? You're sitting in these pews. You're fine. You've got the truth. I'm preaching it to you right here. You know what? You don't have to open your Bible. I'll just tell you. It's just what comes from the pulpit. You just believe that and you'll be fine. That's what the churches are teaching. You're in this denomination. You are fine. You are in a saved position. They're saying the same thing. We're, in a, we're Abraham's seed. We're the church of Abraham. We're fine. But Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abides forever. What's he trying to say? In the house of God, there's one that's going to abide forever, and that's Jesus Christ. If we cling to him and we know him, and how do we do that? By his words, then we can be sons and daughters of the Most High God also and abide forever. Look, it doesn't matter what church you're in. 
You're going to answer for, to God for the things that you've been given. It's time to stand up and forget about what all the preachers and teachers are saying and let the Spirit of Christ preach and teach us straight from the Word of God. Continuing in John 8, If the Son therefore shall make you free, if we cling to Jesus by his words, you shall be free in thee, indeed. I know that you are Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. Does the word of Christ have a place in you? Is it the highest place? Remember, it's a two-edged sword, right? In Revelation chapter 1, I've taken bits and pieces from the first chapter here. I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. John is seeing someone, hearing someone. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Where is he? He's in the sanctuary in heaven. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like the Son of Man, and you can read it for yourself, and out of his mouth came, went a sharp two-edged sword. The Word of God. Are you going to let the Word of God trim away, trim away at the evil things in your life? The next text is a little controversial here, but I prayed about it this morning. And I thought, you know what? I've got to share this no matter what, because it's the word of God. So here it is, 1 Corinthians 15, 44 and 45. There is sown a natural body, there is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Everybody, there's a natural body? Yep. Everybody, there's a spiritual body? Yep. <laughs> That's what the scripture says. But the point is the next text, okay? And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam, it's clearly a reference to Christ Jesus, was made a quickening spirit, a life-giving spirit. Wow, how do we deal with this text? Doesn't Christ have... Some sort of material, maybe a spiritual body like this text says. Yes, he does. But at the same time, he's made a life-giving spirit. You know what? This is how his word gets into us. By this life-giving spirit. By this life-giving spirit. So let's hear a sampling of Christ's words and let's think about Christ's words and apply them to your life. I'll apply them to my life. And for me, it's not going to be pretty. Uh, oh, I missed a text. Here's what Jesus says about the words and the spirit. John 6, 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth. Right? Christ has been made a life-giving spirit to us. It is his spirit that gives us life. The flesh doesn't profit anything. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit. They are life. So now let's look at some of Christ's words that are recorded. The Sermon on the Mount. I guess if, if, we, if we read through this and start applying all these things that Jesus asked us to do, in my personal experience, it wouldn't be pretty for me. You have heard that it's been said, thou shalt love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say unto you, now these are Jesus' words, words to live by. Love your enemies. <laughs> are you kidding me? I can't even love the person in front of me that won't get out of the left lane. You know what I'm saying, right? The frustrating people that we deal with, they're not even my enemy, okay? How do I love these people? 
Bless them that curse you. Wow. Do good to them that hate you. I hope there's only a few people, there's not many people that really hate me. I can think of maybe a few in my life. That kid back in fifth grade that I hit over the head, I actually did this. I hit him over the head with my lunchbox. Can you believe that? I'll tell you what, if I could find that kid today, and I remember his name, maybe I should look him up on Facebook or something like that, and I need to apologize to that kid because it really hurts my heart when I think back. I hit this kid over the head with my lunchbox. He probably won't even remember me, which is a good thing. <laughs> Pray for them which despitefully use you. Can we really do that? The only, the only way that I can do these things is if Christ gives me the power. I have more slides, but I don't know that I need them. You get the point. They that may be children of your Father which is in heaven, for he, may, he makes the sun to rise on the evil and the good, and sendeth rain on the just and unjust. You know, God loves everybody. He loves the guy right in front of me in the left lane that won't get out. He loves the kid that I hit over the head with the lunchbox. For if you love them which love you, what reward have you? Don't even the publicans, in other words, don't even the worst people in society love the people that are close to them? They do. Matthew chapter 6, still the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus, Jesus' words, these are the words that we need to live by. These are the communications from the Father himself through the Son to you and I. No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate one or love the other, or we will hold on to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and anybody else, not even yourself. Therefore I say unto you. Remember, these are words that Jesus got from Almighty God, Jehovah. Take no thought for your life what you shall eat or what you shall drink. Man, that is so difficult, isn't it? Isn't every day about going to work, making enough money to survive, counting your pennies, making sure there's enough in the bank for now and retirement and all those things? How do I fit this in with all that? What you shall eat, what you shall drink, or to put on your body, what you, you shall put on, is not life more, meat, more than meat and body, more than raiment. You get the point. God has messages for us that every day we need to feed on those messages. Like Jesus said, my body is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. Everything about him, God has given us for eternal life. So my presentation today is about encouraging me first and whoever is within the sound of my voice to open the Bible, to read what Jesus is teaching us about his father, about eternity, about how our lives can be changed by beholding Jesus' words, by having Jesus' words and his character in our lives, we can be changed into his image.